Hello, and welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto, attorney at law in the state of Michigan, where I've been practicing law now for 24 years in the fields of consumer protection and lemon law. I frequently write for Jalopnik's sub-blog, The Garage, and also from time to time I write for Opposite Lock. This week's podcast is dedicated to Milo, my faithful Shetland sheepdog who passed away yesterday at the age of 14 and a half. If he was here today, he'd be walking through the background shot of the video, checking on me to see how long it was before I'd finish up talking to myself in this room. And then he'd come in here and sit at my feet while I did my other important work. So Milo, goodbye. Thanks for the time you spent with me. And uh, this show is dedicated to you. Now, today we're going to talk about a topic that is actually the subject of the most popular column I've ever written for Jalopnik. Surprisingly, uh, I've never mentioned this before in a podcast. And the title of the piece I wrote was called, When the Dealership Steals Back the Car They Just Sold You. As of a few minutes ago, it has 485,000 page views. And the idea is exactly what it sounds like. I represented a guy once who bought a car and the dealership stole the car right back from him. And when I wrote the piece on, uh, and it appeared on Jalopnik, I had a lot of people who commented and said, this is impossible, this could never possibly happen in this great country of ours. And yet many people, dozens, chimed in and said, no, that happened to me. So it's a widespread abusive practice that a lot of car dealerships do. You need to be aware of it, and you need to know what to do about it. So the way it works is this. You have to understand, first of all, how the typical financed car purchase happens in America because what happens as a result of what I'm going to talk about is a violation of that and, and most people because they don't understand how a car purchase really works they don't know what their rights are. Generally speaking let's assume I'm a car buyer and I go into a dealership and I'm going to buy a car from the dealership. I can of course whip out my cash and I'm buying a $20,000 car I can hand a $20,000 in cash I drive off with the car we're good to go I own the car free and clear with no liens. Many cars today, however, are financed, which means that I walk into the dealership, I say, I'd like to buy this car, but I haven't got $20,000. What can I do? And the dealership will often say, what you can do is sign this piece of paper where you agree to make payments on the car, and then you'll simply make your payments to a bank. And when you're done paying off the $20,000 plus the interest and finance charges and so on, then the car will be yours, okay? So what we're talking about there is called a retail installment sales contract. And the installment sales contract has you making payments to purchase something over time where the vehicle is the collateral on the loan. That's extremely important. It's called a purchase money security interest. This is all stuff you don't need to know with respect to the terms. But trust me when I tell you that the Uniform Commercial Code's got something called Article 9 that addresses how this stuff is supposed to go down. And a purchase money security interest, purchase money security interest really just means that you're buying something and that something you're buying is the collateral for the loan with which it was purchased. It's, it's kind of like conjuring something out of midair. But someone wants to sell you something, you want to buy it but you can't afford it, they're going to lend you the money. And that's important to realize because generally speaking, in most car purchases in America where you go in and you buy something, whether you're financing with GMAC, Ford Motor Credit, Chrysler Finance, whoever you're buying and financing it through, when you look at the document you sign, it often, most often says that you are buying the vehicle from the dealership and you agree to pay the dealership. It actually says you will pay the seller this money. But then as you read down that long 14-inch document, at the bottom it will say, but the seller has the right to assign this document to someone else. And that assignment is the important part because I walk into the dealership, I say I want to buy a car but I can't afford it, I'm willing to sign papers, I agree to make payments to the seller and the seller assigns those payments to somebody else. It might be a finance company, it might be a bank. But the point is that at the moment I sign that contract, I've got a valid and binding contract with the seller, okay? So what happened in my case that I talked about on Jalopnik when I wrote the article, When the Dealership Steals Back the Car They Just Sold You, my client went into a dealership in Farmington Hills, Michigan. He agreed to buy a car. He gave him $1,000 down and said, I'll make payments on the rest. They produced a finance contract and said, here, sign this. He signed it. They said, you're approved. You're good to go. You'll get a payment booklet in the mail from somebody else. Well, a short period of time goes by. He never gets a payment booklet. He calls the, the dealership and says, what's going on? They said, oh, don't worry. We sent your paperwork to the bank. He calls the bank, they go, we don't know who you are. We've never seen any paperwork from you. And a couple days later, my client goes out one day and his car is gone. He reports it stolen to the police. The police come back and they say, no, your car wasn't stolen. It was repossessed by the dealership. Now, 
How could his vehicle be repossessed when he put the money down, he signed the papers, he never missed any payments? A repossession occurs if you fail to make the payments and you breach the contract with whoever's holding the paper. Remember I told you that the seller can assign the paper to a third party who will then collect the payments from you. What happens in a lot of these cases is dealerships in their haste to sell a car will tell somebody you've been approved and have them sign documents as if they're approved. And then when the person leaves, they'll then call up a bank and say, hey, can you approve this person? And if the bank says no, now the dealership is stuck holding paper. Believe it or not, if you read that document, if the assignment fails, that is they fail to get someone who will pick up the paper from them, buy it from them in essence, then you can just make payments to the dealership. And that's what I advise my client to do. I said, while we're going along here so they can never say you're in breach, make your payments to the dealership. My client would cut a check to the dealership and mail it in every single month during our lawsuit. When we went to court, my client was current in all his payments and we got in front of the court and we, we told the court, look, they stole my client's car. And their excuse that, well, we, we, we tried to get him a loan and the loan fell through doesn't make any sense because that's what they said. But of course, they didn't try to get him a loan before they let him drive off the lot. They apparently only tried after he drove off the lot. I've spoken to a lot of people in a lot of states on this. And I've actually had people tell me, they say, well, Steve, these are legal in our state. Now, I have not looked this up in other states and I can't practice law in any state but Michigan, so I'm not even going to go there. But apparently, in some states, it's a common practice. If you go into a car dealership on a Saturday or a Sunday, if they're open, and you're talking to a guy and you go, I want to buy this car, sometimes the salespeople will actually say that in good faith, we thought we could get this guy financed. And so we sold him the vehicle and said, you know, we're going to get you a loan on Monday. And when the loan couldn't be created on Monday, they then were stuck in a situation where they're holding paper that they don't want to hold and they sold a car to somebody who can't buy it or can't finance it according to the banks that these people have spoken to. Now, what I've tried to discuss with these people when they raise this point, I said, well, in that case, why don't you simply hold the paper and finance this person yourself? They said, well, we can't afford to do that. And I said, well, then shouldn't you avoid taking that risk? If you're signing a document saying, we agree to take payments from this person and we'll simply assign the payments to somebody else. And now I've met people who claim that they had their dealership draft up documents where they have the buyer sign an acknowledgement saying, I understand that I'm being put into a vehicle where the financing is contingent on a third party. And if that third party assignment fails, then I'll return the car and we'll unwind the deal. If that's the case, if that were to actually happen, then I suppose the consumer hasn't been harmed that much. But what happens in Michigan and in the other states where this is illegal it's often referred to as a spot delivery or a yo-yo sale. And a lot of dealerships actually do this on purpose. So someone comes in and they've got sketchy credit, let's say. Uh, they've got money for a down payment, but they've got a bad credit score. The salesperson will say, great, we'll put you in this vehicle. We'll sign these papers. Boom, you roll down the road. Then they wait a day or two and they call you back and they say, hey, we've got a problem. You know, the bank ran your credit and your credit score is so bad that they want us to get the car back from you unless you put down another thousand dollars or unless you're willing to bump your interest rate up, up a couple points. And they'll often get you to renegotiate in a bad way, get you to renegotiate against yourself so that they won't take the car from you. And you need to understand that in Michigan, they've got no legal right to take the car from you at all. Because if you go back and read the document, you bought the car from the seller. The seller agreed to finance you and you signed those terms. When they tried to assign the paper to a lender and the lender said, no, we don't want your paper, that's between them and the lender. That's not between you and the lender. That's not your problem. That's their problem. So if somebody ever calls you up and says, you know that car you bought yesterday, you bought last week, you bought a month ago, the bank wants you to come in and sign new paperwork. You say, well, wait a second, what was wrong with the old paperwork? The only thing that you're ever authorized by me to go in and do is if they ask you to come in and correct a mistake that's harmless in, in a financial manner. So in other words, let's suppose they say, hey, we got the VIN number wrong on your loan. It ought to be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, instead it's one, two, three, four, five, seven, you know, the last six digits of your VIN or something like that. Or, you know, we got your name wrong on the loan or something like that. Yeah, you can go in and correct that. But if they want to change the interest rate, unless they're lowering it for you, you do not let them do that. 
If they want more money from you, tell them to take a flying leap. What I would advise you to do at the very, very least, and this, by the way, is what I got a lot of, a lot of grief for. I'm trying to remember, the article ran in September, September uh, 2014. So it ran about a year ago. And this is one of the first articles in which I said at the bottom, I said, look, this varies so wildly from state to state. What you should probably do is consult a local attorney. And I got a lot of grief from people saying, oh, Steve, you're just telling people to call an attorney because attorneys make money off this stuff. Attorneys can only make money off these cases if the seller's doing something very, very wrong, okay? And they are. And the good news is it won't cost you anything to hire an attorney to go after something like this because there are a variety of laws that these people are breaking. They're not just breaking one law. They're probably breaking several laws. So in the example that I gave you where my client put the thousand dollars down and the, and the dealership repossessed his car, they violated the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. They violated a law on just theft and conversion in the state of Michigan. And that's one of these things that a lot of people get confused. If I break into your house and I steal something from you and I run away with it, besides the fact it's burglary and robbery and all kinds of other stuff, it, it's, it's theft. That's theft. When I take something of yours, I have no permission to take it. It's, it's legally yours, and I take it, and I deprive you of it. That's theft. Now, the interesting thing is if you hand me something or something's in your possession, in my possession that you've put there legally, like in other words, you said, Steve, hang on to this for me. And I have it, and I go, hmm, I've decided I want to keep this. So after you've given it to me willfully on the presumption I'd give it back to you, if I then keep it or use it without your permission... That's what we call conversion. Conversion is when I take something that I have in my possession legally, but I misuse it or I use it in a way that's contrary to your ownership. A lot of legal stuff you don't need to worry about so much. But the cool thing is that in Michigan, we've got a statute, and a lot of states have got statutes similar to this, that if someone steals from you or converts your property, without your permission, obviously, that you can sue them for the amount that they stole from you or the amount that they converted of yours. But you can also sue them for treble damages. The Michigan State Legislature wisely, for once, actually passed a law that makes sense and basically to discourage thieves and those who would convert your goods without your permission, to discourage those people, you can sue them for treble damages. Someone steals $1,000 from you, you can sue them for $3,000. Someone you know, steals $5,000, sue them for fifteen. dollars And also your attorney fees and court costs will get paid for by the bad guys. The only thing you ever have to worry about in a case like this is whether they can pay you, whether they're collectible. The cool thing about this is you're suing a car dealership. Car dealerships in Michigan are required to carry a bond. When you sue them, you get a judgment against them. You can execute on the bond. So I like to sue car dealerships. I've had individuals who ripped off my clients, and I say, well, you know, we can sue this person, but we don't know if they're collectible or not. I mean, I'll, I'll often do some research to find out what type of house the person lives in, what they do for a living, try to find out if they might have the means whereby to pay a judgment. But a dealership's got a bond at the very least. There's $10,000 sitting on the table that we can try to get our hands on. So in my client's case, it wasn't just the $1,000 down that they stole from my client. When they came out to his house and grabbed his car, they stole his car. We actually filed a claim for theft, auto theft. Now, the police wouldn't get involved because they said, well, this is a civil matter between you and the dealership. But I can sue them for this. And the cool thing is when you're suing... Under the conversion statute, you can sue for the damages, which are the value of the goods at the time of the conversion, and that would be trebled because of the statute. So we're suing them for three times the value of my client's car, plus the attorney fees and court costs, and I'm here to tell you the case did not go to trial because the defendants didn't want to put this in front of a jury. And I mentioned in the article I wrote that a couple years later, I was sitting in a restaurant about five miles from this dealership eating dinner, and I looked across the table and I recognized a guy sitting at the other table. And he was the finance manager of the dealership that we sued in this case. And we made eye contact, and he smiled, and he waved. And I thought to myself, that's interesting, because I took this guy's deposition, and I'd asked him under oath to explain to me the rationale as to why the dealership came out in the dead of night like thieves and stole my client's car from his driveway when they had no legal right to do so. And under oath, while still working at the dealership, he tap danced around the question, claimed that they thought they had the legal right, and they were, you know, certain they could work something out, and of course the case settled. But at the restaurant, when he said hello to me, he came over and he handed me his business card, and now it said that he worked someplace else. And he said, Steve, I can talk to you now because I don't work for them anymore. And I said, I'm just curious to know, you know, you guys settled that case with me. Did you guys, you know, the dealership change its ways as a result? And he said, are you kidding me? He goes, well, they did that all the time. That was one of their favorite tricks. 
And I said, so when they sold the guy the car, took the $1,000 down, they knew that they had no financing for him, correct? And, and the guy said, absolutely. They had, they, he goes, they would do that all the time. Put people in cars and do the financing later. Second of all, he said that when they went out to grab the guy's car, the only reason they did that was to shake him down for more money. He goes, we knew we could get him financed somewhere, but we needed to get more money out of him, and we were probably going to nail him with a higher interest rate. He goes, but again, business as usual for that car dealership. And he told me, he said, Steve, I've worked at several car dealerships before that. I've worked at dealerships since that. And I'm here to tell you that that is a common business practice at many car dealerships in Michigan. It is absolutely illegal. They know it, but they make so much money from it. If you think about it from the position of a person who's in extreme dire financial straits, when they're finally told, yes, you can buy a car, it's, it's, it's more than you can afford if you to pay cash, person gets in the car, they drive off, and they get that dreaded phone call a week later that says, you got to bring the car back. We need the car back because you, your financing wasn't approved. Now, of course, the average person might stop and step back and go, wait, you told me it was approved. How could it be not approved now when it was approved a week ago, which is what often happens. But he said, you know something? No one ever questioned that because people would come back. They'd be crying. They'd bring more money. They'd sign anything we put in front of them because to them, it was like, it was almost like a hostage situation. You got a gun to their head saying, give us your car. And he goes, and for some odd reason, people put up with it. He goes, they shouldn't. And he goes, I was glad to see you sue the dealership I worked at. I'm glad that case settled. He goes, you know, he goes, I wish you, you could do more of that to end this practice. So the practice isn't going to end. There's too much money in it for car dealerships, but car dealerships doing spot deliveries or yo-yo sales, you need to be aware of how this works and why it's illegal and how it's illegal. So if you ever buy a car from a dealership and you sign the paperwork and they tell you you're approved for a loan, if they call you back later and say you weren't approved or you're not any longer approved, unless you've breached the contract, that is, you failed to make payments, unless you've done something like that, they're pulling your leg to get more money out of you. So whatever you do, don't let the dealership steal back your car, okay? Call a lawyer. Lawyers will speak to you for free. They'll find out if you've got a case and they'll help you. But whatever you do, don't let the dealership steal back your car. Questions or comments, check out my website, latoslaw.com, L-E-H-T-O-S-L-A-W.com. I'm on Twitter, at Steve Leto, at S-T-E-V-E-L-E-H-T-O. And of course, you can watch and rate this show on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.